AC. Uh, I haven't done this presentation in a while, and a lot of the stuff might be outdated. I tried to update a lot of it. Um, questions are welcome anytime. So before we talk about APRS, we have to talk about packet radio. It was invented in 1978. It's usually connected. It was invented to connect to other stations directly. Everyone heard of packet radio? Yeah. Not as popular now as it used to be. The the basic packet for you know keyboard to keyboard. A C two E V nine. We rigged this uh, camera here. I, I want to get the later. Okay, so what it does is take your uh, computer data, your text string, and convert it to tones. Two tones. It's that, that noise you hear before the British guy speaks a call sign. I won't reach over there. Uh, 1200 baud is the speed on VHF. If you guys remember the 1200 baud computer modems, that's the type of speed it is. It's more for uh, keyboard chatting than sending files, so that you can send files very slowly. The TNC was the gadget in 78 that uh, converted the data into a string. This is a newer TNC. It's a terminal node controller. So it took your computer or terminal and converted it to uh, a packet, which is why it's called packet radio. Feel free to pass that around. So it takes the data and packetizes it, puts it into a packet, converts it to sound, and sends it out over the air as that sound that you're hearing. That was a packet, I'm sending some data. How big is the, how big is the packet? It's adjustable. I can't tell you offhand, but you can pick different sizes or it'll automatically select for you. Um, some of the applications were the DX cluster, where you could uh, get DX spots without being on the internet. Maybe this was before the internet, actually, so they were uh, all excited about that. You connect to the local DX cluster with your packet radio, and you can see uh, HF spots pop up on the screen. Keyboard chat I mentioned, WinLink is email and bulletin boards. Some of the early uh, packet TNCs, this is an MFJ up here. And this is an AEA, I think. So these have been around for 30 years now. Uh, so Bob Bruninga, WB4APR, he invented APRS in 1993. I don't know if he's... C2EV-9. I don't know if he's current currently, but he was a senior research engineer at the United States Naval Academy when he invented it. And it started out with Apple II and VIC-20 programs. In 1993, he had came out with a PC-DOS version that looked like this. This is how I got into uh, APRS, with a, like a CGA color graphics screen on an IBM PC. And you see all the call signs that are reporting on APRS there. And it started around the... Uh, you know, Washington, D.C. area, because that's where he was. Anyone seen this before? Something like that? Yeah. Okay. So Bob says it is not a vehicle tracking system. That's what a lot of people think that aren't that familiar with it, and even though that's what the main use is. He says it is a two-way tactical real-time digital communication system between all assets in a network sharing information about everything going on in the local area. And I'll hope they'll try to show you more about how that works and how, how it does that. Uh, so these are some, some of the things you can do with APRS. Vehicle location, that's the popular one. Uh, anything that moves around, boats, bikes, balloons, satellites, search and rescue. Uh, bulletins I'll show you, weather I'll show you, and Don will do his whole thing on that. Uh, local data about repeaters, ham fest, meetings, personal messages. You can send messages directly to other stations. There are gateways to email and text, so you can get email and text and send from your uh, from your portable or from your mobile. That's not going to work, then. I need to, I need to work the thing. Uh, special events is a, one of my main uses for uh, Aries and Rara. We can show rest stops, support vehicles, race leaders on the map. So digipeters are a big part of APRS, the digital repeaters. They'll hear that noise, and they'll decode it and send it back out again. Same way a, a voice repeater would work, except it's digital, to extend the range of low-power stations. Trackers, which are gadgets that only show location, they cannot digipeat, usually. The simple trackers, like this one here, or even simpler, actually. Feel free to pass that around. I'll show you how the simple trackers look like. 
Uh, most TNCs, like the little box, they can be digipeters. If they can hear a station, they can be set to digipede it out. Even the mobiles and portables nowadays can do it. Eye gates are digipeters that are linked to the internet so that we can see them on the net. I'll show you how that works. Uh, the trackers can, oh, trackers. You can control how many times you're digitally repeated. You don't want to be digitally repeated an infinite number of times because someone in California <coughs> might not care where you are. So usually we just digipeat a couple times in the local area, enough to get us onto the internet, and then people around the world can see where we are. 144.39 is the APRS frequency for a lot of the world, but not all of it. And it's the US frequency for sure. I think Europe has a different frequency. So here's a picture of digipeating. Here's a little tracker. Doesn't show on the screen, though. Yeah. Does yours work on the screen? Yeah. So the car is, you know, low power, five watts maybe. Local station hears them, digipeats them. Another station hears that one, digipeats him. And this one is also an eye gate, so it puts them on the internet. And that's how this guy, you know, across the county can hear the little mobile. This is how you set the digipeating. Um, this is kind of detail, I can go into it later if you want. Like <coughs> how many times you get digipeated. Does that make sense, guys, the digipeating? You don't want to be digipeated forever. Usually you set twice for our local area. If you're out in the country, you can do more. This is kind of an animated version. This guy puts out his signal again. This is a little home station that's not like a mountaintop or a building top digipeter that we have around here. Now here's a high level wide coverage like RIT or something like that. He digipeats it again because he's a stronger signal. All these other places here him and gets put on the internet from one of those stations. I had mine configured for a higher repeater and when I got back from my trip to New England, I had a very you nice nasty gram yes. from one of them because I was tying up several repeaters yep. for no reason. They, they did not like that thing. Yeah, we had an exercise once where they, the uh, fire, fire spotting plane flew over and because he was so high, he was digipeating everywhere and way too much and way too uh, often, like every 10 seconds, so it tied up the whole frequency and everyone's on 144.39, so we all have to share that. Is there any way to ensure that you get to an eye gate? If you don't have enough hops, you may not? In the U.S., you can get to an eye gate within two hops. There's a lot of eye gates. You can specify where you digipeat to, but they prefer you to not do that. So if you know where the eye gate is, you can specify that that's how you want to get to. But it's best to just put this generic. In most seven. places, if you're just doing two, is that enough to get to an eye gate? In most places, it is. Most places, it is. Um, leave that on there. I'm going to show it inside. So you'll see on the message it starts out wide 1-1 one -one and wide 2-2. Two -two. So that'll get you to the fill-in. So this the 1-1 one -one will hop once. So your 1-1 one -one disappears. You're still on a 2-2 two -two to get to a high level. You then decrement 2-1. And then when we get up to the wide area coverage, it'll just be wide 2, which will say do not repeat this signal anymore. So unlike voice repeaters, these the digital repeaters, they know that they've received a repeated signal already, so they don't want to keep repeating it. And then they count, they keep track of the number of hops. A hop is between stations, so they'll keep track of that and stop repeating <coughs> at the two hops. Yeah. And, and so I'm clear that's settable, you set that. You set yep. that in your, your tracker, device. yeah. Now, it was asked last time we did this presentation, what's the Y1 or the Y2? That's only in there for backwards compatibility. There used to be a way that it would decrement both of the numbers, but that's not done anymore. You only decrement the second number down. So that's only in there for backwards compatibility. So you'll go wide 2 2. Next one will pick it up, decrement 1, so it'll be wide 2 1. Next one will pick it up, decrement it, it'll be wide 2. And then that's the last packet that goes out. This protocol has evolved over the years. So uh, it started out with no dig digipeters, or you had to know the path that you had to get somewhere, and it's uh, much more automatic now. Uh, these are some of the digipeters around here. This, uh, in 2012, last time I gave this presentation, these were the digipeters. And you can see they don't cover everywhere. And I just did a search now. 
and this sort of recurrent digit feeders that it's showing. So maybe in sonic topology you might have a little trouble. And these are just estimated ranges of the stations. There's pretty good uh, coverage down here. So you can see how two hops is plenty usually to get onto the network. John, what was the one at RIT? K2GXT. That's their club station digit feeder. Uh, voice alert is what we set on our mobiles so that we don't hear all these noises that you've been hearing. If you don't want to hear that, you set a PL tone so that you'll only hear a mobile if he's close to you, because he'll be sending the PL tone. So if, I, if I'm scanning my uh, mobile radio and I hear a packet, that means someone's close to me on APRS, so I can go look at my APR screen and see who that is. And then uh, the protocol is you can make voice contact on the APRS channel if you want, but move off quickly. Is that, yes, my is that because the digipeters don't transmit the tone? They do not transmit the tone. So you, that, what, what you're saying is only, the only somebody that you hear directly. Only the, mo only the okay. portables and mobiles should be transmitting the tone. Yeah, the okay. digipeters should not. Does that make sense, everyone? Um, Don's going to talk about weather. This is what the weather looks like on the internet, or if you have a mobile app, or even the RF network. It shows up as these uh, little blue icons, and if you click on it, it'll give you all kinds of whatever they're putting out there, temperature, pressure, all kinds of neat stuff Don will show you about that. And the, the offline, I think this is stored at the server, right Don? Not at the station? Right, that's stored on the server. So the one I'm using here is probably APRS.fi, which is an online APRS web page, and it'll store all the weather history or a bunch of weather history. So I'm going to go back to the many days and look. Donald will explain you that. Have 24 hours. So when I give the presentation here and it's uh, you know snowing, I like to show uh, this is Key Largo, 80 degrees down there. <laughs> so there's weather stations all over the world. Uh, bulletins is another app, another application of APRS. If you just want everyone to know that there's a ham fest or an emergency situation or something, you can just broadcast that out and it'll show up on your APRS station. Gives the time, call signs. How are those categorized or how they sorted? Just by time. time. By time. Yeah, the newest one being on top. Yeah, there's, there's currently a bulletin from a amateur radio club in Canada for their right. AMFest, which occurred back on the 30th of March. <laughs> so the information is not always timely. They forget sometimes forget to take them off, the bulletins. So these are messages. You can see the date, time, and the from call sign and the to call sign. So these are uh, private messages. They want it to go to that one station, but of course it's on the air, so we can see them all. But if someone sends me a, a message, it'll pop up on my screen in my car because it has a, I'll show you what my mobile looks like. And if you, if you have, an, through the eye gates, you can actually send a message to another ham in another country and it'll get sent back all the way through to, back to them. Yes. Are there sites that have RSS feeds that you can latch on to? to that might be too much data. I think you can, but yeah, that's too much. I mean, they're, technically you can, but uh, like we get weather bulletins and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we'll get weather bulletins. It's really short. It's kind of like original SMS or it's short message. Yeah, you don't want to get a lot of data yeah. plowing through your radio, plus it ties up the channel. You'll, you might hear some of the longer packets later, too. Are you um, going to tell us how to see the messages or send messages or that sort yep, of thing? Yep. Okay. Uh, satellites have been using APRS for decades. A bunch of satellites have done it. And they just run a, a digipeter, really, space digipeter. So these are Bob's uh, cadets at the Naval Academy that built their satellite. I think those are um, tape measure antennas that pop out when the satellite launches, solar channels. So it's running basically a digipeter, and they can see the track of the satellite there as it flies over their location. So they were probably receiving this at the Naval Academy and uh, receiving a couple satellites there as they flew over. So as they're flying over, you can digipede through them just like you would the uh, you know, digipeding off the uh, RIT building. So if you're in the Sahara or something, no digipeter, you wait till the satellite flies over and squirt out your message. So GPS is a big part of the tracking part of APRS because we want to know where things are on the planet. 
and it's a global positioning system is what GPS is. There's 24 satellites plus some spares. I believe they're not geosynchronous, they're always moving around, but your, your navigation gadget knows usually how to find them. Once it locks onto them, keeps a history of where they go and should know where they are, so it finds them pretty quickly. Uh, this is a GPS receiver. So the way that it finds you, or the way that you know where you are on the planet is a souped up triangulation of those signals of the satellites. Three, I think even with two satellites, you'll get sort of a lock. Three, you'll get a better lock. Four, you get the altitude. So once you have a bunch of satellites that your receiver can hear, it uses the triangulation of the signals and the very accurate clocks that are on those satellites to triangulate your position fairly accurately within you know three meters or something. It used to be a lot bigger and now they're getting better and better. There's also a couple other systems. I think Europe's doing one, Russia's doing one. The newer receivers can receive multiple um, satellite systems. So what you get from your GPS is a string of characters up here. <clears throat> With the time, location, this is latitude and longitude here. In there with the time, that's what your GPS is sending to your tracker or your computer. Uh, this breaks down that whole string. It's, it's just sending a string of characters with all kinds of stuff. The time, your speed, magnetic variation, a lot of data comes from the GPS. So your computer takes the GPS data and makes an APRS string out of that. But it puts in your call sign and all kinds of other stuff to make it a, a string for APRS to use. It puts the little icon that you see on the map is in that string. And once that string is ready, it, again, it goes to the TNC and converts it to sound. <coughs> Uh, 1994, the Mic E came out. This was a gadget you would put between your microphone and your radio. It would inject the uh, APRS packet after you let go of your microphone. So you could talk, let go, and it would make a very short, compressed version of that whole string. The, the one you've been hearing is probably the long one. It's like a second. The Mic E is a one-third of a second. So if you've ever heard guys maybe talking and they let go and you hear a little yeah. that's their APRS Mic E data. You can't send as much data with the mic key. Uh, this is how it compresses it. It takes that long string and converts it. Takes all this stuff, latitude, longitude, and converts it to this stuff. So it's a third of the length. <laughs> it's like a zip file. It zips it up and makes it shorter. Uh, the reason I'm talking so much about mic key is because the function is still built into a lot of the new radios. They call it a mic key or status message, maybe. And it's just a way to put out a shorter packet. It's these canned messages. You can't send a text message or anything with it, but you can just send these text uh, status messages, and they'll show up when you're uh, looking at your tracking map. 1998, it came out with? It's in the tracker. It's in the tracker. No, I have another one. <laughs> Kenwood had the first APRS radio. They uh, cooperated with Bob to invent the... Uh, APRS built into a radio that's got a GPS glued onto the back of it because when it first came out it didn't have a GPS in it. Dual band HD, uh, it actually has a whole TNC in that little thing so besides APRS you can do regular packet radio with it. Any packet app almost would work with that. Then they came out with uh, that wide end protocol at the same time and Kentronics enabled APRS use in this thing. So when Packet first came out, they weren't clicking on GPSs. When they modified the firmware for this one or came out with a new model, they allowed you to hook your GPS up to it and use it as a tracker. Or if you're at home, it would send out your location. So that was a big innovation and allowed APRS to flourish. Um, year 2000, they came out with the mobile version, which I have up here. I'm going to pass it around. So 
So here's the D700. It's a really mobile version of the portable. It's very similar. You can see on the left hand side I'm running the packet frequency 144039. I'm in packet mode up here because I'm using my computer to talk to it. If I was in TNC mode, the radio would do all the uh, computer stuff by itself. It'll show all the stations it's received, give the time, these are fixed stations it says. And if we click on one, we'll see off the location, speed if it was moving, and direction. So this is what I have in my car usually. This is what gets those weather bulletins. I can send this guy a message. Or not. And then on the right side, I use the voice. That's a voice repeater over there. This is the dual bander. I can do two at the same time. This is not, um, it can't transmit or listen on VHF, two VHFs at the same time, so when I send out a packet, it covers over like a, a syllable of what the guy's saying, which is kind of a thing. But it's a limitation of the dual band radio. So that, that was very cool. Yeah. I wonder if we could tie it up with something. <coughs> I'm kind of going backwards because I'll show you how I started with packet. That's not how I started it was with the top of the line gadget. That was, you know, a $500 radio in its day 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. So APR software that you can run on your computer includes UIView, which has been around for a long time. It's my favorite. Xaster is a Linux version. WinAPRS, I don't know if this is still around. So these are... All the software is contained on your computer. There's no internet required. We can be standalone RF, which was how APRS started before internet. You can still get UIView. I downloaded it yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, the author died, so the uh, programming has been frozen since whenever it came out 20 years ago. But it's free to register. It does talk to several mapping programs. So if you're offline, it doesn't have to get Google Maps. And this is a probably early UIView screen, so it's showing a map and a bunch of call signs. This is more UIView, so you can get into details. If you uh, click on one of the <coughs> so the house you click on, they'll give you the information about it. If he's got a text in his beacon, you can say he's using a TMD 700. You can put your website in there and your comments, so that gets beaconed out. A beacon is when you send out your location. Uh, here's one of the weather stations showing the wind speed and temperature. And here's a car that's moving 25 miles an hour. You can see which direction it's going. He's got a Kenwood D700. So you can, uh, how much rain at the weather station. You can get a lot of info just from no internet, all self contained on my laptop. And we're running that here. And this is. Don's car, AC2 EV. So this is what the Kenwood is receiving <coughs> in packet mode, sending to the laptop. No internet involved there. So he wasn't moving, but we got his location. And the You're time. actually on the back table. Yeah, <laughs> it's right back there. It didn't move very far. Uh, here's messages. Just another view I showed you before, another message screen. This is how messages looks in UIView. And if you, if you want to make a message, you just say who it's going to. Put in the text and it goes. These are those private messages. From station to station. I don't quite have any. You should be getting the bulletin from California. I've got some messages. Many, too many wires and too many buttons. <laughs> Is it good? Uh, so I go to message, list my messages, and they're all from K to OQZ, but I'll go, okay. And he says, hi-ho, off to work we go. 
<laughs> so I think he was driving and he saw me driving, so he sent me a message. Hello. Okay, here's something from the weather. Winter storm warning until 15, 21, 25 February. So that was from VE3MUD, so some Canadian weather station or DigiPeter put out the weather message. And then I can, if I wanted to reply to Dave, see his message. If I, I think I can't respond because I'm not in that TNC mode, but if I wanted to reply, I could just hit message in the car and it would uh, send him a message. Is that unit still available from this Kenwood? One? Yeah. 300 bucks on eBay. Okay. A lot of them. The, this one is 100 bucks on eBay. And this also, you can hook up to your GPS, you can hook up to the laptop and do all the same stuff. This, the screen is very small, and I'll show you. The pictures I tried to take of it 20 years ago. So this in the old days was how you would do packet or APRS or anything else. You'd have a radio going to your TNC, that little gadget, and that's a small one. The big ones are they're pretty big. Which still works, you can do that. Now this was uh, you know, a while ago, but there are all kinds of other TNCs now, USB hookup TNCs and Bluetooth TNCs. With GPS, with most of these gadgets, you need a serial port. That's important. Even the, the new Kenwood need a serial GPS, not a USB GPS, which is a, what a lot of your car navigation GPSs are. A lot of the hiking ones are serial ports, or the older ones are serial ports. Bionix sells a dedicated one for $70. And the e-tracks I'll show you is about hundred dollars. So this is what uh, mobile uh, APRS used to look like. You put your laptop in the car with your KPC3 under the radio there. So it's a VHF radio, the KPC3, the GPS is on the dashboard probably, and your laptop's running a UIView or something like that. And this is how I did road rallies and Aries events and all that stuff. Um, after the dedicated hardware, they came up with the sound card interface that they're, we're still using today. So the computer does all the uh, packetizing and the digitizing and undigitizing of the uh, data. Uh, this is AGW, which is a sound card driver. So it makes the sound card look like uh, a TNC. So your software doesn't know that you're using a sound card. You just say, instead of going out your serial port, <coughs> it goes to the sound card driver. And you don't need a lot of hardware to hook it up. You can just plug it into your mic and speaker. You know, you can use a fancy interface, but it's not necessary. Okay, web is uh, APRS.fi is my favorite. It's in Finland. So when when Ralph sends his location from his tablet, squirts out that noise that we hear. It goes to RIT. RIT puts it on the internet. It goes to Finland. The guy in Finland puts it on his web page and we see it here on the screen you know, five seconds later. And this is the most popular online APRS viewer. APRS.fi is the web page. And then you, up here you can type in the call sign that you're looking for. You can, you can ask for you know, the last seven days and it'll show the track. You can see Ralph, his track here from Tylai. And every point that he make, he sent out a beacon, puts a little dot, and he finally arrived here. It says he's on the other side of the parking lot. Like I said, the GPS is not always exact. I've so, got it set for the distance of, I think it's 200 yards. Right okay. Now. And that's coming out of my cell phone right here. Uh, I think it is. I know on my radio, I can... And, the portable too, I can turn down the precision, so if I don't want people to know exactly where I am, I can dumb it down a little bit and it'll give the general area. And I'll, I'll tell you How long a track does it keep? Uh, he'll keep years. Yeah. The guy in Finland will keep years. My, hit my balloon track was on there for a couple of years. It depends on if you overwrite your data, it'll get rid of the oldest stuff, or if he runs out of space, maybe it'll get rid of the oldest stuff. Yeah. At least a week, usually. 
definitely depend where you're sending it from. I was in Ireland right. uh, six or eight years ago, and I, I still could find that one for a long time in Ireland. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, findyou.com is another one at the bottom there, findyou.com. It's, it's more uh, more basic, not as graphic and fancy. APRS World was a good one, but that one's gone, I think. This is more um, APRS.fi. So this time we're looking at a bunch. You can see weather stations. So the trackers can pick what kind of icon they sent. So the EOC is sending this icon. It, in that string, it puts a character that says, when I display on a map, show the EOC symbol. The digipeters show this star thing, the weather stations show the weather. This is showing a car, this is showing a van. <coughs> There's you know dogs and motorcycles and boats, airplanes, balloons, you can pick whatever. Uh, There's dozens of little, before they were emojis, they, they were little icons, so you can pick your icon. So we're showing a track of somebody here, this purple line. Hard to see who he is, but he started up here maybe and ended up here, so he might be under this weather icon. And there's, here's a guy in the throughway. So again, each little red dot shows that he beacons. So he beacons here, he beacons here, he beacons here. Uh, you can set for a time interval usually or a smart beacon, which is the more often you move and the faster you move, the more often you'll beacon. So if you're parked, it'll go every half hour or whatever you set it to. As soon as you start moving, It'll beacon more often. As you're going around in circles, it'll beacon more. So here we can see a van. He started out here and beaconed a couple times until he got to where he was here. Any questions about all that? Again, this is the, uh, I don't know why the HE is in there, but this is an old uh, screen capture on the APRS.fi. So I've got it set to let show the last six hours. That's why it's showing the the tracks there. Uh, here's one of me. So the downside to that tracking and beaconing is that your wife may know where you are. <laughs> uh, the upside is you, you might know where your wife is. <laughs> um, my wife called me once, I had the tracker in her car, and she said, where am I? I'm lost. I said, well, you're, and I looked on the map, I said, you're so-and-so, she was out at the mall or something, uh, you know, out of town mall, so I had to tell her where to go to, to get back on the road. So when my son graduated from college, um, he went on a trip to find himself, and he drove all over, and I said, hey, you want to take a tracker with you, and he did, and he was gone for a couple of months, and so I looked at all of the places the, that he had been, mm -hmm. and it was like a flower, right? It, there were all of these branches going out, but they always returned to... Uh, Providence, house. Rhode Island. Yeah, his girlfriend's house? Yeah, I said, well, it's there. And I, and they've been married nine years. <laughs> but he, he finds that track. If we could find it, it would be very embarrassing yeah. for him. <laughs> so this is just a screenshot of me. I was going six miles an hour. Uh, you can see my, my bearing there is 140 degrees. I was 416 feet above sea level. Pretty basic. Oh, it shows my track. It's hard to see on my screen. So I started uh, here at home. <coughs> I was in Pittsburgh and I went home and then I went downtown. Again, the red dots every time I beacon. <coughs> this is probably smart beaconing because see here it's more often as I'm going faster. And then slower, it's uh, here I'm on the loop going fast, three in a row. Uh, it says when the position came in. You can see it here, it keeps all my points for the whole year. So, this APRSFI is free to use. If, if sure you, is. You have to have a mobile too. Right, you have to have a call sign. You can use it off of your cell phone. Yep. I, I use mine off my cell phone extensively. Yep. Uh, in fact, I got into this before I had a radio, I knew it would. Uh, the only downside is if you use it on a cell phone, I, I have an Apple one and I know others use it on Androids. Uh, it tends to run in the foreground so it can suck your battery out. Uh, the newer ones you can run in the background but you don't get as much beacon. That's if you're on the app. You can just run the website right. uh, on your mobile and, and see just a mobile version of this. If you get the app, like Ralph's talking about, you can actually put out the <coughs> application from the app. Uh, Apple and Android. Correct. This is uh, 
APRSworld.net, which is not working anymore, but I tracked uh, K2SI from here to Dayton, just to see how it looked. And you can see you got pretty good coverage. Every black square with a red square around it is the network hearing him. And you know, there's a couple little gaps, but uh, you did pretty well. That's why you only need those two hops. And it was, you got to an eye gate, which put them on the net so I can see them. Uh, this is me again, same type of trip. So obviously you can show just one, one call sign or all the call signs that's uh, selectable on uh, APRS.fi. So here I put in two call signs. I put in Ralph and Don, and it shows them both on the map. So if we're working a uh, Aries event, a marathon or a bike ride or something, we can just put the you know the ten call signs that we're looking for on here, so we won't see all the other stations on the map that will uh, confuse us. Uh, Direwolf is another like uh, AGW. It's a software modem that appears like a TNC to the software and puts in a new, a new software package. Uh, YAAC is another uh, software you can load on your laptop to, to do full, and it's multi-operating uh, systems too, so it'll do full APRS capabilities with maps and tracking and everything. And there's others. Uh, APRS Droid is a popular Android APRS program. It's got all the functionality just in your mobile device. Uh, iOS. This is the APRS.fi that Ralph was talking about. This is on your uh, Apple phone. So this is the little tracker I've been talking about. I couldn't find one because mine are so old, they're buried in a box somewhere. But it's uh, Tiny Track by Bionics. Um, I think the guy's name is Bion, Bion something. His first name is Bion. But Brian with a Y. Uh, it's $40 for a kit. It's a little circuit board, like a one by two circuit board. That's this thing in the middle. This is the tiny tracker. You see it's smaller than the little HD, and that's a fairly small HD. This is a little, they call it a hockey puck. It's not the size of a puck, but it looks like a puck. GPS is plugged into the tiny tracker, and the radio is plugged in on the other side. So plug in the power, GPS gets the signal, sends it to the tiny tracker, this packetizes it, sends it out audio to the <coughs> mic speaker connector, goes up the antenna. So this is what we've used for decades. You, you know, carry this in your car or you put it on a bicycle or something and this is how you get on the network. Uh, $45 for the built-in version, the GPS is 70, so 150 bucks with the radio cable and everything, you can have a tracker. Uh, Open Tracker is a very similar gadget at argentdata.com. Those don't actually tune the radio to 4439. They do not tune so the radio. You have to do it yourself, yeah. Yes. There, so. There's versions of built-in radios, so they're even cool. Yeah, I, I but make sure you have it on there, otherwise it'll be Yeah, I do that, all over I do that with mine even. Hit, hit the button. Uh, so this is the configuration program for the tiny track. Instead of plugging in the GPS, you plug in your serial port, and you set it, you set the call sign and the the wide one dash one all that stuff into the tiny tracker. You can put in the, uh, the smart beaconing stuff that I mentioned. You can put in all these variables on how many how much angle you're turning, how fast you're going. You can switch easily between two configurations. So if there's a one that you use in the parking lot and one that you use when you're moving, you can switch between those two or two radios, whatever you want. All kinds of settings that you can set in there. And then it flashes that into the tiny track and then unplug it and you're all set. Uh, more APRS handheld radios have come out since the early days. So now uh, Yezu is a big one. They've got a bunch of theirs that have built-in APRS. And usually a GPS now is built into the radios. Kenwood's got the, that was the D7. They came out with the D72, which had a GPS right in it. Now the D74 is APRS, GPS. D-Star, analog, I don't know what else, but there's a lot in this little thing. There's a lot of uh, computer in there. Voice recording, Bluetooth, color display, color display memory card. Um, ICOM, I think, doesn't have a real APRS radio, or I don't want to say not real, but they call it, they have their own version, which they think is better. 
which is DPRS, which is using the DSTAR network. It's very similar. They'll put their location to the DSTAR network, and then that will gateway usually, I think, to the the regular APRS network. You might have to. I'm not sure of the details. You might have to specify how it gets there, or if it does get uh, gateway, I'm not sure. John, there's a parameter on the gateway that you tell it which of the APRS servers to send the data to. On the on your ICOM portable, I would say that. No, it, it, for example, in log, log in W2 RITB, yeah. the settings for that repeater have the root to okay. the APRS network. So it's it's everyone or nobody then? Everyone that goes into the digipeter? Or you can pick individual people. I'm not sure I understand your question. If you if you tell RIT to put everyone's APRS on the network, will they do that, or can can you go by call sign? This is D Star, yeah. right? Yep. So it puts all of the D Star packets into APRS. Okay, that's cool. So if you had uh, DPRS enabled on your radio, yeah. those packets would go into the APRS system. So I wonder if we could tell on APRS.fi if they've come through there. From D Star, I wonder if it shows that. I haven't looked for that. I, I don't think it does. So if you it look, just looks look like it can't If you look on the network it. now, you'll see my hotspot, um, my gateway on there, and I could transmit through RIT, and then you would see that. You can you can tell when you click on these guys how they got to the network. So this is Ralph's. He was uh, he came to APRSFI from APRSFI iOS. So we know he came from his iPhone, <laughs> iPad, whatever. If you click on Don here, he came from K2GXT. So K2GXT heard him because he was set for that wide stuff. So he came over the radio. So if you and look at W2RITB, if you you know you scroll down to the southwest. RIT boy? Yeah. Baker? Yep. So he came by TCP IP means he was on the internet. Yes. So that's what it looks like. Because that is the RIT D star. So it's actually the multi protocol repeater. So the location might have that in the string. It might have W2 RIT B in the string. So we know it came from uh, D star. Maybe. That's cool that you can get all that info from the packet. That's all in that packet, it's in the path. So those are the APRS portables, uh, APRS mobiles. The this is the D seven hundred, and Kenwood now has the D seven ten, which is just fancier capability, more memory, bigger screen, which is nice. <coughs> it, it does have a built-in GPS now. It didn't when it first came out, and it's over five hundred dollars still. Big bucks. The Chinese are coming. I haven't seen any yet, but they're talking about it online, and I think I think some Chinese guys are talking about it online. Usually they have Chinese displays, so if they don't have English words on them, this is all numbers. But they'll, they'll be coming. I hope we'll see a Bao Feng APRS or something eventually. It'll be very confusing, but cheap, <laughs> cheap and confusing. <laughs> if I may add, the Anytone Eight Seven Eight DMR handheld has an analog. <laughs> Uh, APRS mode as well as a yeah. D DMR uh, APRS mode that'll yes. send data to a top group. So DMR is the low cost digital protocol. A lot of Chinese radios are coming with DMR and we're getting local repeaters with DMR and hotspots with DMR. And they'll have their own, probably if you DMR APRS, it'll gateway back to APRS set up FI eventually. Uh, that's my D700 again, so you can see the screen a little better. There's the list of stations it heard. Uh, here's one that's moving. He's 0.9 miles away. He's going uh, 29 miles an hour. He says, I bought a new mobile. And here's that message screen. So this is the same stuff I showed you. That's the D72, the newer version of that one. This one, this one also does HF, I left that out, uh, 220, and VHF, UHF. 
No flashlight, though, speaking of that kind of that fancy color screen? Junk. This was 600 when it came out. They're you know, five something now, I think. Uh, this is when I tried to take pictures before, you know, cell phone cameras. I tried to take pictures of my little V7. And the E-Trax, this is my Garmin E-Trax little hiking GPS. It's, that's about the right size compared to the HD. It's smaller than the HD. Had a serial output so I could plug it into the HT. Kind of hard to see. It had a monochrome screen, but you can see some. Here's KCTGXV-2 maybe on there. So it does show a little tiny map and the call signs. So that's on the Garmin then that that shot is the Garmin. This little blue thing. So that the screen. We'll come back to you can have it. Display that information on the Garmin. Yeah, the Garmin has a serial. Overlay. It has a serial port built into it. So okay. the radio receives that same kind of string that you're putting out, puts it out to the GPS, and it shows up on the screen. So oh. It actually puts it out as a waypoint, okay. my, based uh, on the location. When I'm tracking a high altitude balloon, I put my D710 display up on the dash. This, this thing goes up on the dashboard, and right next to it is my car navigation GPS, a very special one because it's the only one that does it. But the balloon beacon will come in on the radio. The radio will send it out to the GPS. It'll show up as a waypoint, as a balloon, and I can click on it and navigate to it. And the car will tell me the GPS will speak and so say, tell you what right, angle you have to get to. It to says <laughs> how far away it is and uh, where I have to go to find it. That's the ultimate uh, balloon chasing yeah, setup. I didn't realize you could send the GPS waypoints over serial. Yeah, any any old serial GPS should be able to do that if it speaks the standard uh, protocol. Uh, this is, this is uh, at the time it was new, APRS radio, big giant display, it was nice. This is fairly new, the Mobile Link B is a little TNC APRS computer that you can plug into your radio and then you Bluetooth to the TNC thing to do the mapping. So that little box is, you know, half the size of the radio, plug into the radio and then you use your phone to Bluetooth to this to run the APRS program. And any app that, uh, the apps that Ralph has, instead of talking to the cell network, it'll talk to this gadget and do its APRS thing. Here's another tiny track. This is the tiny track here, the little blue box. Uh, so this is a larger than life. It's a big HD, but you can see the e tracks is, you know, palm size thing. I couldn't find mine. It was buried in a box somewhere. But the e tracks is talking to the tiny track and the tiny track is talking to the radio. So you plug this in, and that's, that's the whole thing, except for the antenna that we can't see. Another track there, similar to that one we saw, all spread out. This is, uh, <coughs> this is the GPS. There's a tiny track in here, doing the same thing. The GPS goes in, uh, tiny track connects to the radio. Radio shack, what's that? <laughs> Vintage. These just sell batteries. Antique. Antique GPS. In fact, this one. This is one of my trackers. This is the guts of that Radio Shack uh, GPS. And there's no steel, so I can't stick this to anything. That's a Tupperware tiny track. Tupperware tiny track. This this uh, magnets onto the roof of your car. So I had the. It's just got the GPS, but I had the tiny track in there with a the little antenna that stuck out the top. <laughs> So you, can you see on your own device in your car where you are? Yeah, and that way you know when it blows good. off the roof, I'm going to go back and get it. Good, yeah. Well, wherever it goes, like, I'll find it. It'll, it'll still be it's still, long as it's still working. So here's my D700 again. But it's not. It's on the space station. They've had a Kenwood radio up there for many, many years. I think they have the 710 now, but that's when they had the 700. And you see the guys uh, are holding it, talking, using the voice, and it does packet, and it does APRS sometimes. Uh, another one with a gel cell, GPS, tiny track, radio. So that's the whole thing. Put that in your, whatever you're tracking. Take this to uh, Tour de Cure and put it on the supply truck or whatever and track it. So the antennas that you're using with these are not really critical. <laughs> it depends where you are. If you're doing the whatever they go to 
between here and Syracuse, and I'll show you later. Save that question for later. So this is how I tracked my wife. The yellow box was in the trunk. <laughs> she knew it was there. It's a lunchbox, the yellow plastic lunchbox. It's got a tiny track inside and a gel cell and a solar panel in the back windows with another picture with the GPS. There's their Radio Shack GPS, the solar panel, uh, their plug-in somewhere over here. <coughs> the plug-in here. Antenna with a you know, mag mount on the trunk or something. Oh, there's an HT in the box too. This is my Mike E 50 watt tracker, so there's a mobile radio in there. Okay. Oh, yeah. it looks better there. So this does the packeting. There's a GPS, you know, external and uh, the radio. The problem I had with that is uh, I didn't put any vent holes in this case. So it got pretty warm in there with a 50 watt transmitter. This is not mine. This is someone that's got the 710, the Kenwood 710, GPS, serial GPS, laptop, and I don't know where his radio is. Maybe down here. Oh, that's the Kenwood, yeah. His wife sits in the back, I presume. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I've had a very similar setup for road rallies. You're driving around in the mountains of Pennsylvania sending out first. road rally times. <laughs> yeah, the wife doesn't want to go to those things anyway. So how are you mounting the laptop? He's got a mount that goes down to like a seat bolt, this pole here. Oh, okay. Like a police car mount. Pretty sturdy. Here's a fully self-contained one. GPS is here. HT, obviously, a tiny track. He plugged in the cigarette lighter. There's another one, GPS. Got two GPSs for some reason. <coughs> One has a display. Could be another. It's an antenna. GPS antenna. Oh, it could be. Um, micro track. This is a radio and APRS. So you need a GPS to plug into it. This is popular with the uh, high altitude balloon people. This is a one by two, weighs less than an ounce. So plug in your GPS antenna and power. Four hundred dollars. That's pretty cool. Uh, Bionics makes a lot of balloon stuff, a lot of APRS stuff, a lot of uh, fox hunting stuff. Which Tim mentioned the fox hunt in the spring. This is one of the foxes. Like the Saturday Night Live guys. Foxes! Hidden transmitter, so we'll hide this somewhere in Monroe County usually. Um, this, usually the day before Mother's Day, not always, but it's usually around that time. We, so. When we decide when it is, we'll announce it to the Ra Ra email list, which hopefully everyone's on. Ra Ra General. And sometimes we have multiple foxes, and then this is one of my trackers that uh, has a directional loop antenna that hopefully tells me what direction the fox is in, and that's how we find them. You don't need anything fancy, you can just use an HT, and we will show you how to do it with an HT. If you guys are interested in mapping and direction finding and stuff, uh, that's a very fun event that, that Tim has done. I know. The, the, the day before Mother's Day is also the uh, Valen Winding Seminar at EOC. So, uh, you can hike well, so don't go to that. Oh yeah, maybe we'll do that. Yeah, that'd be fun. We could start from there. So we usually start at nine and go till lunchtime. And then we all meet for lunch and talk about why we couldn't find the fox and how we stepped in the creek and stuff like that. Pick up two ticks on you while you're up in Webster. Yeah, pick up ticks. My dog can get the ticks. It's an so special events is a big use of uh, APRS for me. I'm going to wrap this up, Don. Uh, because Net Control wants to see where their assets are. They want to see where the bike mechanics are. They want to see where the rest stops are. They want to see where the sweet vehicles are. Right, Mike? Yes. Um, Aliases are especially useful, so that on the map we see sweep one instead of NTJ. <coughs> I think on my map I'm showing that. Somewhere. I'll show you what that looks like. Oh, you can actually put routes on the map. I'll show you those. <coughs> these are some of the events we've done with APRS. So if you're signing up for one of these events, <coughs> tell, tell Mike that you have an APRS tracker so he can plan for that. Do you, do you do the aliases at your end, or do we yes. have to configure? Yes. You okay. send out your call sign. I'll show you what we do. Okay, great. Uh, this is Tour de Cure one year uh, when they used to go around the lake. Um, Cayuga or 
Ganesha's Lake that go around. This is the shorter route. And this is uh, KB2EJZ-9. So it started in Mendon Ponds and went around to Geneseo and back. This is how we would track them at net control. And this is N2JC-7. You can see I went around the lake. So I had the longer route. And this is a bunch of us. Well, it's not just one of us. This might be me doing multiple tracks, but I don't think so. Oh, Rochester Marathon, I had the Geek Cycle. Here's my E-Trex. Here's my D7. They look about the same size here, but this one's closer, I think. So I could do voice and HRS with that one radio. The antenna on the back. Okay, the, someone asked about the, oh, the coverage, Ralph. If you're going from Rochester to Syracuse, there was no coverage in the middle here, so we put a portable digipeter here. There was no digipeter in this area at the time, so we had good coverage here in the pink areas, but not in the green. So there's, there isn't coverage everywhere, so you have to plan for that, if you can, if you know you're on a fixed course. Uh, Empire State Games. So in the UI View program or other ones, you can make an alias list. I won't show you, but you just go in and say, whenever you see N2JAC, call it Med 5 instead. So here's Med 5. These are the doctors for the Empire State Games. Mm -hmm. We wanted to know where they were. Also on the map, I put all the venues. So, so this was up on the big screen at Net Control, and we could see where they needed to go and where they were at the time. The doctors did not want us to know where they were. <laughs> they did not like that. They were not happy. And especially when I zoomed in on the Google Maps and showed them which parking space they were in. It wasn't their car, but it showed which parking space they were in with a satellite view. That scared them. <laughs> I assume maybe they're you know, more used to it now, but this was cutting edge stuff back in the day. This was before cell phone tracking and find my cell phone stuff. Here's another view of the same map, the same doctors, the same venues. So this is all aliases for their call signs. In fact, you could see in the previous one, there was a <coughs> PC2GXV. I didn't have him set up as an alias, but he showed up there. Um, Barktoberfest, and also another use of uh, UIView is you can use anything as a map. So this is the, the thing they put on their webpage, and I you just pick some coordinates and you can make this an actual map in the program and it shows the stations on the map that they're using for their course. And this one showed the rest stops and again it shows the stations on the map that they're using for their course. So the, this net control likes to see something like this. So all those giant trackers you saw, this is my dog APRS tracker. <laughs> it's strapped onto my brother's dog for Barktoberfest. And this one I couldn't find too. It's probably in the same box with the E-Tracks, but it's uh, he's not a big dog. It's about a, I think it's an eight millimeter uh, videotape case. It's got the GPS antenna here. It's got the micro track. There's a little uh, high altitude balloon tracker <coughs> battery in there. So John, would that be a K9 call? <laughs> <laughs> the icon is a little dog. It shows up as a dog on the map. I don't know if he was on the. Uh, I don't think he's on this one. <laughs> Well, we, I, you can set his icon to be a dog. There's a different uh, scooter there with a the radio on it. Uh, balloon tracking, you can see here, this is the micro track. This board is the radio and the APRS. Uh, this little battery here, here's the GPS. So that's all you need for the tracker. Very low power on these guys because they have good altitude, a good line of sight. And this little thing can go around the world multiple times. Here's the guy's hand in this solar panels. Something like a micro tracker. These usually don't do APRS. They'll uh, gateway, they'll transmit whisper or something else, low power and HF, so that we can track them uh, across the ocean where there's no digipeters. But they will usually gateway to APRS. How do they make the balloon so that it's, it's just a party balloon? In rupture, like most of them. They calculate how much helium goes into it so that it only goes up so high, and then it goes, it'll float up and down. It won't go all the way up to. The higher altitude ones will inflate halfway, they'll go up and get bigger and bigger because there's less pressure outside, they'll burst and come back down. These will just float if they fill them right. And they have all kinds of calculations. This is one of the bigger balloon payloads. 
All right, you probably just need here. Here's the, the D7 radio. That's their tractor. They have a camera outside. GPS up at the top. <coughs> this is their film, the helium balloon. Question, John. Yep. I've got the, uh, the uh, Kenwood the 74D. It has yes. APRS in it. Do I have to, anything I have to do other than learn how to set it up in the radio, any registering or anything like that? To APRS? Yes. Put in your call sign. I think that's all you have to do. I mean, it's been a year since I did mine. Just put it <coughs> in, into the radio. Yep. Kenwood has a YouTube video on how to set up APRS. There's a lot of YouTube okay. videos for that radio. And there's other people, no, private people that have them too, but there's yep. Kenwood themselves has a, as well. Is that your cat, Andrew? Yeah. Thank you. Not my cat. <laughs> the end, any questions? I have a, a little legal question. With respect to remote operation and controlling and whatnot, so this is in the trunk of your wife's car, yep. driving around. Yep. Well, is that I'm, considered a remote device for you, or how does that legally? I know where work? she is, so I can go turn it off if someone goes around with it. Yeah. Okay. Is that what the I FCC? Is that what the operator. FCC thinks? I'm the control just... operator. Same with the balloons. I know where they're going, so okay. we can control them. And we, you know, we test them to make sure they're not interfering. Well, them. yeah, obviously. I'm just curious of, of how that falls, what that falls under. Usually, if they fail, they'll stop transmitting. I've never seen one transmit too much. So if something mic. goes wrong, they'll stop transmitting. Usually, if it was a problem and it started keying, you know, by itself, that would be a problem. I've never seen one do that. Though. I got a question for you. I took the APRS handheld to Kenwood. Plane just to see mm -hmm. what it would do. Once I got higher, I wasn't able to connect it to any of the sites. Some of the GPSs will not go too fast or too high for uh, security reasons. GPS issue. Yeah. The, About um, 10,000 feet, they yeah. typically yeah. disable. That's about if you're, where it's if you're doing a high altitude balloon that goes to 100,000 feet, you have to get a special GPS that will work that high. Okay. That I was fine enough they usually about 4,000 feet, and then yeah. I started getting spotted. Yeah, for regulations of that. I thought maybe it was on time. So nope. you can't make a ballistic missile. Yeah. <laughs> this is actually the real reason. Yeah, I, I don't know how they decide, because you can buy them for 20 bucks in line. I don't know how they decide if you're a terrorist or a ham guy. I don't know. Thank you. Good question, though. Okay, Don, you're up. Woo-hoo.